Well, I think, you know, beyond that role as a fundamental human need, um, I think it's there's plenty of reasons like organisations should, you know, start to care about their employees as well um, because obviously it has a, a big impact on mm. business outcomes um, as well as individual outcomes. So um, I think it's something that we all need to take into account um, so whether it's a, the business or the the individual. And I think one of the things about workplace wellbeing is that it's been really difficult for businesses to manage um, or measure, actually, over the years. So, you know, how do they even tell um, how their employees are coping? This episode is proudly brought to you by Mapper Forwards Workshop. It's time to become a coffee consultant. Learn how to diversify your revenue streams and create freedom from your day job while saying goodbye to that alarm clock forever by becoming a consultant within the coffee industry or directly to consumers who have shifted towards home brewing and home roasting. Protect your income from challenging times in the coffee value chain by taking this course today. Go to mapperforward.coffee forward slash workshops or click the link in the show notes for details. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Map It Forward, friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and this is episode one of a brand new five-part series where we are talking about the workplace for coffee professionals and the role that nutrition and workplace well-being plays in that. And joining me for the first time in the podcast is Nicole Dynan, gut nutritional dietitian. Am I saying that? Is that what your title <laughs> is? <laughs> Yeah, a gut health dietitian, but that's good. Welcome to the <laughs> I podcast, to most Nicole. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Don't we all? Um, yeah. It's such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. And shout out to our mutual human, uh, Angela <laughs> de Blasio, for uh, connecting us and for bringing you onto this podcast. This is a real pleasure for me to have you on the podcast. Um, we are talking about the role that nutrition plays in workplace well-being. The reason that this is so important is because as I keep talking about on the podcast, this is a really volatile time in the world. And it's my opinion that in challenging times, bringing things back to the basics is going to help you navigate that. And one of the, the two things that I think that we have the most control over, but we tend to forget about are our sleep and our nutrition. And who better to help us with our nutrition yeah. <laughs> than you. So welcome to the podcast. Um, Thanks, Lee. Thanks for having me. I'm really, um, yeah, so happy to be here as well. And uh, gratitude to Angelo as well for the introduction. So why don't you help people understand uh, what it is that a dietitian does and what you specifically do? Um, well, dietitians are university qualified health professionals. So we spend a lot of time learning all of the science behind nutrition. So everything that we do with our clients and with workplaces in the instance of our business um, has to have an evidence base. So we need mm -hmm. to be able to yeah, rely on scientific evidence for everything that we're conveying. We can't just, you know, rely on hearsay or anecdotal evidence. There has to be scientific research behind everything that we do. So it can take quite a while at university to get that qualification, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's definitely worth it and it gives us the opportunity to help a lot of people one-on-one -on -one, um, and also reach and help more people through workplace nutrition as well. And when we talk about gut health, what are we talking about specifically? Well, when we're talking about gut health, we used to be talking about, you know, the nine metre tube that ran from the top through to the bottom mm -hmm. um, and, you know, metabolism and all that sort of thing. But now we know that there's trillions of microbes that largely live in our large intestine that are having a very exciting impact on different health areas um, that we're learning about. And it's early days, like, you know, it's only probably... 15 to 20 years into this gut health science, but it's probably the most exciting thing that's happened in nutrition science mm. in that time. Um, and, you know, hence we're still learning, but we're certainly learning that our gut can now um, impact our mental health. So from a from a workplace wellbeing perspective, that's really powerful for us because, as we all know, mental health has been a huge 
uh, uh, discussion topic, particularly post-COVID. And talking about COVID, you know, our industry, the coffee industry, is one that really was occupied a very interesting space during COVID. We were deemed as essential, um, but we also were deemed to have to be uh, copping the brunt of a lot of the force that was coming from everything that was going on during COVID. We had to be customer facing. We also didn't, uh, you know, having to go back to our families and 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 navigate that very uncomfortable space of, but you've been out in the wild and now you're bringing the COVIDs back and uh, mm. to the workplace and the stress that's involved in that, plus being overworked, being run down, uh, and the shift in consumer behaviour since then has really created some turmoil. With that comes a shift in workplace dynamic and creates mm. extra stress for business owners. It creates extra stress for employees. And so I wanted to have a conversation about what role workplace wellbeing is going to play for an employee and for a business owner. And specifically in this episode, I want to kind of explore why that's important and why, uh, what role that nutrition can play in that. So could you tell us why workplace wellbeing is important? Absolutely. Well, I think, you know, beyond that role as a fundamental human need, um, I think it's there's plenty of reasons like organisations should, you know, start to care about their employees as well. Um, because obviously it has a, a big impact on mm. business outcomes um, as well as individual outcomes. So um, I think it's something that we all need to take into account. Um, so whether it's a, the business or the the individual. And I think one of the things about workplace wellbeing is that it's been really difficult for businesses to manage um, or measure actually over the years. So, you know, how do they even tell um, how their employees are coping? Mm -hmm. um, so there is a big movement out of the UK and Oxford University called the World Wellbeing Movement. Um, and they basically have identified four pillars that can help employees really, you know, work with their employees, work with their employees to determine how their well-being is. And so it's things like job satisfaction, happiness, you know, how happy are they at, at work and at home, um, stress, are they stressed out? in the workplace? Are they stressed getting to work in the morning because, you know, they've got to be there at a certain time and mm. yet they've got to drop the kids off? Um, and purpose as well. Like, are they actually being given things that they find real value um, and purpose in, in terms of their workload? So all of those things can really contribute to well-being. And sometimes, you know, I don't want to trivialise it, but it's sometimes just asking questions mm. as well of employees, particularly in small business, if they don't have like the resources. What, what kind you know, of questions? Just, um, yeah, like, um, you know, you seem really stressed this morning. Like, um, is is this starting time working for you? Uh, like, you know, because they may have the kids to drop off or they've got something else going on at home in the morning mm -hmm. that they might be a carer or something like that. Um you know, um, you know, how, how are you feeling today? Like, you know, just kind of asking that question, are you satisfied with the work? Is there anything we could do differently to support you? Uh, you know, so just asking questions of the individual about their own personal enjoyment and well-being in the workplace. Mm. Um, and of course, you know, if they could, um, you know, put it in a survey form, you know, sometimes people are more open from an anonymity point of view, if they can answer it mm. anonymously. And then, you know, workplaces actually showing that they're acting on that feedback so that they get people contributing openly um, for future surveys and things like that. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, it's it's a massive topic, workplace wellbeing, but having a few parameters around how to measure it in your own workplace I think is a good place to start. And you're a you're a small business owner too, so this is not something that um, is foreign to you. the The interesting thing about the coffee industry is that we seem to be because of the low barrier to entry, 
we seem to be the place that people start in small business. And usually people think, well, how hard can it be? Everybody's doing it. There's this kind of success fallacy that exists around opening a coffee shop or opening a roastery. And people think, well, you know, I make great espresso at home on my, you know, home machine and, you know, everyone loves my muffins. So I'm just going to get an espresso machine and make really great muffins. And everyone's going to just show up because everyone wants to be a barista. The truth of the matter is that it's a really, really low profit margin uh, business. And on top of that, we have the ne- the generation that is aging into our workforce is deciding that it's easier to make money on OnlyFans than it is to be a barista. So yeah. why it's putting a kind of force on the or a stress on the current workforce um, that is becoming untenable. So automation is becoming something that's coming into our industry that's either going to help or hinder the progress of our industry. All of this is creating more stress for business owners and for the workforce. And the low barrier to entry means that often business owners are so stressed in what they're doing that knowing how to make their staff feel seen with some of the questions that you were mentioning Mm. is not even usually a consideration. Mm. Yeah, and I can totally um, relate to that. You get caught in the day-to-day operations Mm. and, you know, just getting through the day with the list of priorities that you have that, you know, sometimes focusing on staff wellbeing or even your own wellbeing can become a lower priority. Um, but the thing about nutrition in stress and what you're talking about there is it can, it can really be something that can make a massive impact on someone's ability to cope with stress and yeah, and it can be, um, something that can be quite cost effective as well. Like it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go and buy a whole range of expensive pills and potions you know, to support your health just to achieve, um, you know, better stress um, resilience and all that sort of thing. Um, And it comes down to that connection between the gut and the brain. Um, And we've had a big focus on that here in Australia this month with Gut Health Month Mm -hmm. um, and talking about food and mood um, because there was a trial back in 2017 called the SMILES trial Mm-hmm. which really looked at that exact connection, like can can we influence um, our mood? And they looked at people with clinically diagnosed depression um, and one group had a dietitian um, and got a simple um, modified Mediterranean diet to eat and the other group um, just had like, um, you know, stress support strategies And they actually found that the group who had the dietitian and the dietary intervention um, had much better outcomes at just 12 weeks, which which was three months. Wow. Um, And so, (laughs) yeah, so we, the great thing I love about that story is that the Mediterranean diet is a peasant diet, right? So it's based on legumes and and things you can grow in your garden, seasonal veggies that can be really quite cost effective um, and that sort of thing and whole grains. And so, you know, we can apply some of those principles to to any diet to to try and increase, uh, you know, the ability of the diet to support the gut microbes that then have that influence, um, you know, on that gut brain connection, and then our stress and mental health management. Which is really interesting because usually in cafes, what's happening is that people are eating on the fly. They're usually Mm. eating croissants and cakes and and all the sugars and, you know, very simple carbohydrates and um, no nutritional value at all. And they're topping that up with constantly having milk and coffee and uh, or alternative milks that have lots of emulsifiers in them and whatnot. And Mm. what I'm hearing you say is that if an employer wants to shift, uh, perhaps the, the, the well-being in a workplace, that providing a very cost-effective meal option for their staff could be a way that they might be able to help uh, show up and see their team and conspire to their success that way. 
Absolutely. Like it doesn't, it doesn't need to be expensive. Yeah. Um, it doesn't need to be complex. Um, but certainly changing changing some of the fuel that we put in during the day so it's not those rapidly absorbed sugary you know, mm. carbs that are going to spike the blood sugar level, then all of a sudden we're in the 3 p.m. slump, right. you know, and just fatigued and finding it hard to get through the day. Um, we want that consistent balance of, you know, slower um, absorbed nutrients so that our body can actually support us better from an energy level perspective, you know, mental health mood perspective, um, and also stress management perspective because, we all know, like, if we eat well, we feel better. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I, I do love an analogy, Lee. Um, <laughs> I always think about, <laughs> I always think about like a house when I'm thinking about this this whole story. And I think, you know, the walls are the physical health because they're the, the strong bits that are holding everything up. Um, the roof is the the psychological health because it's protecting us from the outside and keeping oh, wow. you know us yeah. cozy inside. But the foundation is really nutrition, and so mm. if the foundation's not right, like everything else falls apart. Ultimately, I love so that. yeah. So I really love to think about nutrition in that way, and that's absolutely what we're starting to convey to workforces to you know get them to really take seriously nutrition as part of uh, workplace well-being and supporting the mental health of their staff. Now, speaking of houses and nutrition and foundations, uh, the foundation of most of our lives seem to be caffeine these days. <laughs> so <laughs> in the next episode, folks, we're going to talk about whether coffee as a stimulant is uh, a fuel or is it a foe? So uh, join us for the next episode as we start to delve into like caffeine and the role that it plays in gut health. So we'll speak to you then. Peace, love, and peanut butter. Have an amazing rest of your day, guys. I really hope you enjoyed this episode, friends. Please don't forget to show us some love by subscribing, liking, commenting, and most of all, sharing this podcast with your friends. Check the show notes for links, including our sponsors and our Patreon. And stay tuned for more great conversations on the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward.